passing to other topics, he made many observations on the Russian war. Among other things, he said that war should have been the most popular of any in modern times. It was a war of good sense and true interests, a war for the repose and security of all that was purely pacific and preservative, entirely European and continental. Its success would have established a balance of power and would have introduced new combinations by which the dangers of the time present would have succeeded by future tranquility. In this case, ambition had no share in my views in raising Poland, which was the keystone of the whole arc. I would have permitted a king of Prussia, an archduke of Austria, or any other to occupy the throne. I had no wish to obtain any new acquisition, and I reserved to myself only the glory of doing good and the blessings of posterity. Yet this undertaking failed and proved my ruin, though I never acted more disinterestedly and never better merited success, as if popular opinion had been seized with contagion. In a moment, a general outcry, a general sentiment arose against me. I was proclaimed to be the destroyer of kings. I, who had created them, I was denounced as a subverter of the rights of nations. I, who was about to risk all to secure them, and people and kings, those irreconcilable enemies, leagued together, conspired against me. All the acts of my past life were now forgotten. I said truly that popular favor would return to me with victory, but victory escaped me, and I was ruined, such as mankind and such as my history. But both people and kings will have cause to regret me, and my memory will be sufficiently avenged for the injustice committed upon me. That is certain. If certain passages in the above conversation of Napoleon should require illustration or proof, these will be found in the following letter. The document is highly valuable on account of its date and contents. For the motives and views of the Russian expedition are here developed by Napoleon at the moment when he was about to embark on the enterprise. The vulgar were certainly far from comprehending or rendering justice to his intentions. I say the vulgar, for it is just to remark that among statesmen and men of foresight and extended views, the Russian war was very popular. They disapproved of the moment at which it was undertaken, but they fully appreciated all the great intentions of the emperor. Instructions given to M to serve as his guide in the mission, which he will have to fulfill in Poland, April 18, 1812. Sir, the high opinion which the emperor entertains of your fidelity and talent induces him to advance you so far in his confidence as to entrust you with the mission of the utmost political interest. This mission will require activity, prudence, and discretion. You are to proceed to Dresden. The ostensible object of your journey will be to present to the King of Saxony a letter which the emperor will deliver to you tomorrow after his levee. His imperial and royal majesty has already acquainted you with his intentions and he will communicate to you verbally his final instructions respecting the overtures which you are to make to the king of Saxony. It is the emperor's intention that the king of Saxony should be treated with all the consideration to which he is entitled from the particular esteem which his majesty entertains for him personally. You will explain yourself both to the king and his ministers with unreserved candor, and you will give credit to the hints you may receive from the Count de St. Pilsac. With respect to Saxony, there will be no sacrifice without compensation. Saxony can attach but little importance to the sovereignty of the Duchy of Warsaw, such as it now exists. It is a precarious and troublesome possession. The sovereignty of that fragment of Poland places Saxony in a false position with regard to Prussia, Austria, and Russia. You will develop these ideas and treat this question in the way in which it was discussed in your presence. In His Majesty's closet on the 17th, you will find the Dresden cabinet, the 
not much inclined to oppose you. Its diplomacy has presented to us the same observations on several previous occasions. The matter in question is not the dismemberment of the states of the King of Saxony. After a short stay at Dresden, you will announce your departure for Warsaw, where you will await new orders from the emperor. His imperial majesty begs that the King of Saxony will accredit you to his Polish ministry. At Warsaw, you will concert your measures with Prince Blank, the Emperor's Chamberlain, and with General Blank. These two individuals, who are descended from the most illustrious Polish families, have promised to exercise the influence they possess among their fellow citizens to induce them to exert every effort for securing the happiness and independence of their country. You must communicate to the government of the Grand Duchy an impulse calculated to prepare the great changes which the Emperor proposed to make in favor of the Polish nation. It is necessary that the Poles should second the designs of the emperor and cooperate in their own regeneration. They must consider France only as an auxiliary power. The emperor is aware of the difficulties he will have to encounter in his endeavors to bring about the reestablishment of Poland. That great political work will oppose the apparent and immediate interests of his allies. The reestablishment of Poland by the arms of the French Empire is a hazardous and even a perilous enterprise in which France will have to contend against her friends as well as her enemies. We will enter into a few details on this point. The object which the emperor has in view is the organization of Poland with the whole or a portion of her old territory, and he wishes, if possible, to effect this object without engaging in war. The furtherance of this design, His Majesty has granted very extensive powers to his ambassador at St. Petersburg. He has sent to Vienna a negotiator authorized to treat with the principal powers and to offer great sacrifices in territory on the part of the French Empire by way of indemnity for the sessions to be made. For the reestablishment of the Kingdom of Poland, Europe is separated into three great divisions in the west, the French Empire, in the center, the German states, and in the east, the Russian Empire. England can only possess on the continent the interest which the powers are willing to reserve to her. A strong organization of the center will be necessary as a precautionary measure, lest Russia or France should one day be tempted to extend their power and to attempt to gain the supremacy in Europe. The French Empire is now in the enjoyment of the full energy of her existence. If she do not at this moment complete the political constitution of Europe tomorrow, she may lose the advantages of her situation and fail in her enterprises. The conversion of Prussia into a military state, the reign and conquest of Frederick the Great, the opinions of the age, and those of the French Revolution have annihilated the Germanic Confederation. The Confederation of the Rhine is only part of a provisional system. The princes who have been gainers would probably wish for the consolidation of that system, but those who have been losers and the people who have suffered from the calamities of war and the states who dread the too great increase of the French power will seize every opportunity of opposing the maintenance of the Rhenish Confederation, and the princes who have been aggrandized by the new system will seek to withdraw themselves from it as soon as time shall establish them in the possessions they have obtained. France will in the end find herself deprived of a protector, which certainly she will have purchased by two many sacrifices. The emperor is of opinion that ultimately at a period which cannot be far distant, it will be proper to restore the states of Europe to their complete independence. The house of Austria, which possesses three vast kingdoms, must be the soul of this independence on account of the topographical situation of its states, but it must not be the ruling power. In case of a rupture between the two empires of France and Russia, if the confederation of the intermediate powers were actuated by one and the same impulse, the ruin of one of the contending parties would necessarily ensue. The French Empire would be more exposed to danger than the Russian Empire. The center of Europe must be composed of states unequal in power, and each possessing its own peculiar system of policy. These states, from their situation and political relations, will seek to support in the protection of their preponderating powers, and they will be interested in the maintenance of peace because they must always be the victims of war. 
with these views after raising up new states and aggrandizing old ones in order to fortify our system of alliance for the future. The establishment of Poland is an object of the utmost interest to the emperor and to Europe. If the king of Poland be not restored, Europe will be without a frontier on that point, and Austria and Germany will be face to face with the most powerful empire in the world. The emperor foresees that Poland, like Prussia, will ultimately become the ally of Russia. But if Poland should owe her restoration to France, the period of the union of the above-mentioned states will be sufficiently remote to afford time for the consolidation of the established order of things. Europe being thus organized, there will be no longer any cause of rivalry between France and Russia. These two empires will have the same commercial interests and will act in conformity with the same principles. Before the coolness with Prussia, the emperor's first intention was to form a solid alliance with the king of Prussia and to place the crown of Poland on his head. There were then few obstacles to be surmounted, for Prussia was already in possession of one-third of Poland. Russia would have been left in possession of what she might have insisted on retaining and indemnities would have been granted to Austria, but the progress of events occasioned the emperor to alter his intentions. At the time of the negotiations of Tilsit, it was found necessary to create states precisely in those countries which most dreaded the power of France. The moment was favorable for the reestablishment of Poland, though it would have been the work of violence and force. The war must have been prolonged. The French army was suffering from cold and want, and Russia had armies on foot. The emperor was touched by the generous sentiments which the emperor Alexander manifested towards him. He experienced obstacles on the part of Austria, and he suffered his policy to be overruled by the desire of signing a peace which he hoped to have rendered lasting if through the influence of Russia and Austria, England had been prevailed on to consent to a general reconciliation. Prussia, after her reverses, manifested such a spirit of hatred towards France that it was deemed necessary to diminish her power. With this view, the Grand Duchy of Warsaw was created. It was placed under the dominion of the King of Saxony, a prince whose whole life had been devoted to the happiness of his subjects. Endeavors were made to conciliate the Poles by the establishment of institutions agreeable to their tastes and conformable with their manners and national character but all was badly managed. Saxony, separated from her new possessions by Prussia, could not with Poland constitute a body sufficiently organized to become strong and powerful. The opening of a military road through the Prussian territory to communicate between Saxony and Poland greatly humbled the Prussians, and the Poles complained of disappointed hopes. The emperor stipulated for the occupation of the fortresses of Prussia in order to ensure the certainty that that power would not seek to rekindle the torch of war. The campaign of 1809 proved the prudence of his policy. He adopted the firm resolution of laboring unremittingly to complete the system of organization in Europe, which was calculated to put a period to disastrous wars. The emperor conceived that he must appear formidable from the number of troops which he has marched towards the Vistula and from the occupation of the fortresses of Prussia, measures which were necessary for ensuring the fidelity of his allies and obtaining by means of negotiations what perhaps he can, after all, secure only by war. The dangers of the present circumstances are immense. The removal of armies to the distance of 500 leagues from their native territory cannot be unattended by risk, and Poland must rely as much on her own exertions as on the support of the emperor. I once more repeat that if war should ensue, the Poles must consider France only as an auxiliary, operating in aid of their own resources. Let them call to mind the time when, by their patriotism and courage, they resisted the numerous armies who assailed their independence. The people of the Grand Duchy wish for the reestablishment of Poland. It is for them to prepare the means by which the usurped 
provinces may be enabled to declare their wishes. The government of the Grand Duchy must, as soon as circumstances permit, combine under the banner of independence the dismembered fragments of their unfortunate country. Should it happen that any natives of Poland under the dominion of Russia or Austria shall refuse to return to the mother country, no attempt must be paid to compel them to do so. Poland must derive her strength from her public spirit and patriotism, as well as from the institutions which will constitute the new social state. The object of your mission, therefore, is to enlighten, encourage, and direct the Polish patriots in their operations. You will render an account of your negotiations to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, who will acquaint the Emperor with your progress, and you will send me abstracts of your reports. The misfortunes and weakness of the Polish Republic were occasioned by an aristocracy which knew neither law nor restraint. At that period, as at present, the nobility were powerful, the citizens oppressed, and the great mass of the people were nothing. But even amidst these disorders, a love of liberty and independence prevailed in Poland and long supported her feeble existence. These sentiments must have been strengthened by time and oppression. Patriotism is a sentiment natural to the Poles. It exists even among members of the great families. The emperor will fulfill unconditionally the promise he made in Article 25th of the Treaty of the 9th of July, 1807, to govern the Grand Duchy by laws calculated to ensure the liberty and privileges of the people. And consistent with the tranquility of the neighboring states, Poland shall enjoy liberty and independence as to the choice of her sovereign. That point will be decided by the treaty which His Majesty will sign with the other powers. His Majesty lays no claim to the throne of Poland, either for himself or any of his family. In the great work of the restoration of Poland, he has only in view the happiness of the Poles and the tranquility of Europe. His Majesty authorizes you to make this declaration and to make it formally whenever you conceive it may be useful for the interests of France and Poland. His Majesty has ordered me to transmit you this note and these instructions in order that you may make them the subjects of conversation with the foreign ministers who may be at Warsaw or Dresden. The Emperor has ordered notes to be forwarded to the ministers of war and foreign affairs of the Grand Duchy should pecuniary resources be wanted. His Majesty will assist the Polish treasury by assignments on the extraordinary domains which he still possesses in Poland and Hanover. The 26th. I was informed that the emperor was very unwell and that he desired I would attend to him. I found him in his chamber with a handkerchief rolled round his head. He was seated in an armchair besides a great fire which he had ordered to be kindled. What, said he, is the severest disorder, the most acute pain to which human nature is subjected. I replied that the pain of the present moment always appeared to be the most severe. Then it is the toothache, said he. He had a violent secretion of saliva, and his right cheek was much swelled and inflamed. I was alone in attendance upon him, and I alternately warmed a flannel and a napkin, which he kept constantly applied to the part affected. And he said he felt greatly relieved by it. He was also affected by a severe nervous cough and occasional yawning and shivering, which denoted the approaching fever. What a miserable thing is man, said he. The smallest fiber in his body assailed by diseases sufficient to derange his whole system. On the other hand, in spite of all the maladies to which he is subject, it is sometimes necessary to employ the executioner to put an end to him. What a curious machine is this earthly clothing, and perhaps I may be confined in it for 30 years longer. He attributed his toothache to his late drive, as he had felt singularly affected by being out in the open air. Nature is always the best counselor, said he. I went out in spite of my inclination and only in obedience to reason. 
A doctor arrived and he found that his patient manifested symptoms of fever. The emperor spent the remainder of the day in his chamber, occasionally suffering severely from the toothache. At intervals, when the pain abated, he walked up and down between his armchair and the sofa and conversed on different subjects. At one time, he alluded to the base conduct of some of the individuals who had been about him during his power, a family who were established in the interior of the palace, who had been loaded with benefits, and who, it may be added, behaved most disgracefully at the period of the catastrophe, where one day detected in some offense or other by the emperor himself, he merely reproached them with their misconduct instead of punishing them for it. But what was the consequence, said he, this only served to irritate them without affording a just example. When things are done by halves, they will prove ineffectual. The fault must not be seen, or if seen, it must be punished. He next mentioned a woman who, together with her husband, held a very lucrative situation and who was constantly complaining to him of her poverty. She often wrote to me, said the emperor to ask for money as though she had claims upon me, just as Madame Bertrand or any of you might do on your return from St. Helena. Alluding to an individual who had behaved very ill to him in 1814, he said, probably you will suppose he fled on my return, but no such thing. On the contrary, I was beset by him. He very coolly acknowledged that if he had felt a transient attachment for their bourbons, for which, however, he assured me, he had been heartily punished, but this, he said, had served only to revive the natural affection, which all oh, so justly he really entertained for me. I spurned him for me, and I have good reason to believe that he is now at the feet of the royal family, relating all sorts of horrors about me. Man is always and everywhere alike. Finally, he mentioned a most infamous intrigue which was set on foot by persons on whom he had lavished favors these individuals endeavored to prevail on the empress josephine to sign a most degrading letter under pretense of securing her tranquil residence in france but doubtless with the real purpose of gaining credit to themselves in another quarter the letter which was to have been addressed to the king contained a disavowal of all that she had formerly been and what she still was together with the request that the king would provide for her as he pleased the empress wept and resisted the importunity asked for time and consulted the emperor alexander who told her that such a letter would utterly disgrace her he advised her to dismiss the meddling intriguers by whom she was surrounded assured her that there was no intention of removing her from france or disturbing her quiet in any way and promised to be responsible for her himself in case of necessity in the evening the emperor felt better and he enjoyed a little sleep his countenance bore evident marks of the severe pain he had suffered